Okay, so <laughs> thank you, thank you. So this may sound like a very pretentious title, uh, but I actually mean it very literally. How saves save our game world and also make us as developers a little bit happier. So there are some good vibes in there. So I want to start with this question to all of you. Did you ever lose a dear save game? I know this is <laughs> I know this is hard. Yeah, everybody probably, if you've been gaming a part of your life, has lost something. These are some of the personal tragedies that I've experienced, <laughs> where a memory card got corrupted, or I lost my XCOM 2 save with my cool characters and my progress in beating the aliens, or even Steam uh, complaining like, "Hey, your cloud is out of sync," and giving me all this anxiety. Um, yeah, so. I'm Manuel, I'm a tech lead, and I work daily with safe games, so I feel a huge responsibility. I'm sorry to put you through these memories, but I'm here to tell you it's going to be okay. Safe games, if you take proper care of them, they can live long and prosperous lives, and they can even enrich your life as a player, but also as a developer. And we're going to have a, a look into that. And I want to mention that I uh, participate in a lot of game jams, which gave me a healthy obsession with iteration speed, which is also a part of this talk. We have a lot of ground to cover, and it's going to be technical, so I'm glad only the people stayed that want technical stuff. So it's not weird that we uh, value safe games so much and that we feel anxiety when we lose them. Uh, lo lots of pop culture goes into this, and this is a quote from Westworld, which says, what is real? Death, which is irreplaceable, and believe me, some safe games really feel at least irreplaceable and are really hard to replace, if at all possible. If you don't like Westworld, you can also go to The Matrix, it has a lot of quotes about this as well, mostly half of it. So let's just look at a couple of games, specifically management games, that's what this talk is about, that's what Abbey Games develops, management games. Uh, so this is Anno 1800, it's a modern uh, management game, and as you see, there's a lot going on. There's this uh, tiny view of the world, and there's already lots of buildings, villagers, but also around the screen you see this hut where there's a lot of state being tracked, and there's the mini-map on the left side, and there's AI characters to keep track of. Uh, the safe state of this type of game can become huge, it can become complex, it's very interconnected. This is another game, Two Point Hospital, in which they track also a lot of abstract state about uh, the characters that are walking around in it. And this is Reyes, it's our first game, it's from uh, 2013, uh, probably the one I'm most familiar with. Um, and as you see, there's also a lot going on, not only the things that are on the surface of the planet, but also on the top right, you see the state of a single city. Uh, it has tracked how much wars it has won, how much resource it has, has collected, how much danger there is. The giants themselves have this RPG system going on, there's a lot uh, tracked there. Uh, for this type of game, saving is quite hard, and we'll go a lot uh, deeper into why saving games is hard, but also why it's really valuable. So, management games are world building. You've seen these worlds, they're always about building some type of world. Even if it's not a physical world, it's like creating your, your own story, for example, like in the last uh, talk, you also build up a lot of state. Um, but if you think about it in technical terms, that means that uh, world building is actually safe game building. If I'm really cynical about it, all you do when you start up uh, Civilization VI and you play for dozens of hours, you've made a safe game. That's what you made, <laughs> right? You've experienced something as a human, but in technical terms, you've made a safe game. Uh, and that's not to say that's not valuable, it's just that safe games actually are representing a lot of that value of what you do in management games. So if you look at management game development, that means that's world building building. We basically are the shepherds of the players creating the game state. And some of the unique challenges that we have in creating, developing management games is that we need a very much a code-based workflow because there's lots of systems in there. Systems are developed until deep in uh, production because systems are the content of management games, of strategy games. And game state is very, very important because the game world is large, complex, and the player probably loves it after 20 hours of gameplay, if not more. So when I uh, started in Unity, which was in the start of 2021, I knew how to make management games. We did it in our own engine called Abicore for like almost a decade. And um, 
are actually in several different engines. So a lot of experience with that. Uh, but we, for several reasons, we turned to Unity. And there were a couple of things that I knew I wanted from Unity, but I only had like a month's worth of experience combined in there, uh, in, in, the, in the tool. So what I want is a code-centric way of work. And I want this because, one, there are lots of systems, but also lots of things that we do, like technical art, procedural generation, and AI. They're uh, very technical, and it's nice to do them in code. At least I prefer that, and uh, everybody that works at Abbey Games currently knows how to program. Uh, there's lots of UI, but it's not a static UI. It's very dynamic. It changes all the time. It needs lots of behavior. Um, and just in general, lots of interacting systems. Uh, but I don't want to you know, only work in Visual Studio. I also want to work in Unity because it has all these nice things, like the scene hierarchy. That you can click around in your game world. You can see in the inspector what the state of every object is. And there's prefabs, which are wonderful ways to uh, create assets, save assets, change assets. Um, and you know, I think that uh, high iteration speed is one of the core things that you need in a development process to, to achieve uh, quality. And of course, I've already talked about safe state a lot by now. We need a clear representation of that safe state. It needs to be savable. And it needs to be easy to expand because we're going to make lots of it and we're going to do it really fast. So um, I have a demo actually for this talk, and we're going to switch around to it now and then. There's going to be lots of demo effects, even though I've tested it a bunch. So I cannot announce our new game yet, so what you'll have to do with this really simple thing. And two things are obvious from here. One, I'm not an artist. Um, and the second one, actually not so obvious, is there's no, not really anything going on in the scene. So this here is the scene. I guess you can read it. There's some camera and lights, there's this bootstrapper object, and then the whole game is this object. If I delete it, I don't have any game anymore. If I restart it, I have a game. This game is about three people going into the world, much like Abbey Games uh, at some point in time. I'm trying to do stuff. So I talked about how we need the hierarchy and the inspector, and if we look at this object, we actually see this is the entire game. It is the game, it has a list of villagers in there. These villagers have names, apparently. I carefully named them with my procedural generation. Uh, this is Fotumai. Uh, got a, some list of buildings. Um, yeah, so this is what the game world looks like. Uh, and because my game is just a single object, I can delete it and easily create it again. Uh, so I have this hotkey, I press Control R, and I just restart the game. Uh, without ever e exiting or entering play mode. So that's the first thing I want to do for iteration speed. I don't want to leave play mode ever, um, which doesn't seem like a challenge for simple projects, but later on it becomes quite hard. So whenever things get screwed up in our uh, safe game state, we just press Control R and we start again. Um, okay, so that's just a small piece of that. So the, uh, what I'm wondering about is how do I represent my safe state? So is what we just saw in the, uh, in the hierarchy actually our safe state? Well, it looks like it, because if I save my game, I want my villagers to exist. Later on, I want my buildings to exist. But really, there's also other stuff in there, like the cube. I don't care that a villager is represented as a cube, because later on, the artist will actually put something in there, and it's not represented as a cube anymore. So we don't want to save that. If we load our game in, an, if we load our old save game in a new version of the game, we want it to be uh, something else. Um, so no, the scene is not actually our save game, even though it looks a lot like it. I want to save the game along with all the state under there. This seems like a pedantic conceptual point, but it's important because there's a difference between persistence uh, and transience. So persistent things is everything that goes into your safe game, basically everything that matters the next day you wake up. And then uh, transient things are things that you can either reproduce or you want to change between versions um, or are somehow derived from the persistent things. If you would try and save everything, like you could say, why, why don't we just try and save this whole scene, uh, put it on disk somewhere, and whenever we play the game again, we just load the whole scene, and then we continue. We don't want to do that because it could uh, take quite long to do all of that if your game is really big. Uh, your save game can become really big. The hard thing is you have to make sure that everything in your game is actually serializable, so you can actually put it to disk and retrieve it from there. 
And the sad thing is you cannot iterate on your transient data. You cannot change, for example, the prefabs because somehow the prefab instances are stored in your save game. So you don't want to save the whole scene. So we, we have to find another representation for that. So an example uh, in, in Reyes for persistent data is the fact that there is a village in the bottom right, but uh, the, an example of transient data is the fact that this village is represented as buildings, as individual buildings. So let's look into the demo and the, at the difference between that. So I have a safe game. Let's add some more villagers. Um, I've got lots of villagers, and at some point I will save my game. I can actually do it already. We'll later look in, uh, into how that works. Uh, but I don't like the way my villagers look, so I go into this villager prefab, and I change it to, I guess, I'll just create a sphere. Um, I guess you've done this before. Um, and sure. Okay, so let's do it. It doesn't change immediately, but if we load our game, we see all the villagers are now spheres. It's not like um, uh, maybe very impressive because you you maybe worked with prefabs and you've changed prefabs, but notice that I still have tracked the entire state of the game. So all the villagers are still in the same position, and if I look at all my friends, I see they still have the name they originally got. And to prove that, let's actually call one Hank and just save and load it, and let's see if Hank is still there. Nope, it's because I changed transient data instead of persistent data. So let's try that again. And we've got Hank right here, it's Hank. Okay, so if I want to change persistent data, well actually I just did that, I changed persistent data in the inspector, and because my save game tracks that, it uh, gets, um, it, get, it gets tracked throughout anything. Like I can exit play mode, I can close Unity, I can load my game, everybody's in the same place, and my villager is still called Hank. So what if I want to expand my game model while the game is running? For example, I want to add the fact, um, well, let's do this a bit later. That's probably easier. Okay, so what we can also do, of course, is changing logic if we're iterating on our game. So if we have our game object and we want more villagers to spawn, I could simply uh, change the spawn count by a lot. Normally you would put this in the inspector, but say you really need it uh, to be in your code for some reason. You can go here. Now you see I've, I've simulated Unity fucking up, uh, sorry, screwing up the game state. Um, <laughs> because. Unity can actually uh, hot load code and it can com recompile and continue playing, but usually it doesn't. When you have an advanced project, my experience is it doesn't. I don't know what your experience is and I'd love to hear about it after the talk, but um, I've simulated what happens with me. Lots of errors as soon as you recompile your code, so that's why I have control R, but I don't want all the villages to uh, respawn, or actually in this case I want because that's what, what what I was testing, but I can always go back to Hank if I miss him. So Hank is right here. He'll never leave. So let's uh, change that back. Um, so I want to talk to you a bit more about iteration speed and hot reloading, uh, because I care a lot about hot reloading, and I've wrestled a lot with different ways to make Unity uh, use new logic without actually throwing away all my valuable Hank. Um, and other game state. So the code iteration cycle simplified down is like this. You start at one, you identify a bug or a change you want to make, then you make the change in code if you're, you have code-centric development. You recompile the code, or mostly the com computer does that for you, and then you restart play mode often, or I just press Control R, which is basically the same uh, in this case, and then you reproduce state to test. And especially at the last step, can be very, uh, uh, can take very long. Like, think back of your save game that you lost. If you want to recreate that, it's gonna take a long while. Uh, for developers, it can be a little bit faster if you, for example, use cheats to speed things up, but still, it's gonna be hard. And four is really detrimental to your game's state, so we, wanna, we don't wanna do that. So one way to do it is to, so we wanna improve the cycle. We wanna speed it up, 
and maybe cut some things out. So uh, we could avoid code changes altogether, but we want code-centered development, so that's not going to be an option. We can use cheats, like I mentioned, but what we really want is hot reloading. We want our state to be maintained as long as we're uh, working on the game, as long as we're working with this state. That's the holy grail of iteration speed, uh, at least according to me. Uh, so we like hot reloading. Do we like recompile and continue? So that's the Unity way of doing hot reload. It's on by default. Um, well, we have to go into that a little bit. Um, because it doesn't, it, it has its limits. So I'm talking about a lot about serialization. I use it somewhat synonymously with saving and loading. But what it uh, is, it just means uh, whenever you have a runtime object, like the villager in my game, and I want to store it to disk, I have to transform it into bytes. And if I want to load my villager back, if I want Hank back in my Unity project, in my game, then I have to somehow deserialize these bytes and change it back into a Hank. And then I've got it. So that's what serialization is. Unity, uh, Unity's serialization is meant for everything except for saving games. So they use it and it has its limits. I'm not going to go into the details because Unity has written a lot about it, but you'll notice that you cannot always trust that Unity saves your entire state. For example, you cannot save static fields if you use them. So say goodbye to your singletons. Uh, do that anyway, maybe. Um, uh, so they use their serialization to save assets to disks, uh, to show stuff in the inspector, and to restore objects if you compile and load, but also if you exit play mode and enter play mode, or if you start Unity. But they don't use it, or at least they don't advise using it, to save your game. You could try, you could save your entire Unity scene to a JSON file, for example. Unity offers tools for that. But then you'll soon notice if you've developed new versions of the game, your save isn't stable because instance indices change. That's a very technical reason. Takeaways, just don't do it. There's, uh, in all my um, efforts to try and achieve hot loading in Unity in the past two years, I found three incredible frustrating barriers. So one of them is if you go from edit to play mode, then all your objects are actually um, removed. Well, actually, no, the objects stay there, but they all go through a domain reload, so the entire C sharp state changes. Unity serializes uh, some things, and there are a lot of callbacks going on, and this may influence the state that you have. So um, I want to, no, let's go on. Uh, so the script recompile is another one. If you change something in your code, all the C sharp scripts are going to change. Uh, they cannot, C sharp objects cannot survive that. So all the C sharp objects are destroyed. Unity uh, saves all the state internally. They create new C sharp objects for all your scripts and they deserialize everything in there. So again, you have to contend with Unity serialization. Um, also your C sharp recompile and save games are also a really hard barrier because they can traverse a lot of different things. They can bridge time. I can save my game for tomorrow space. I can give my save to you. I maybe travel through space and radiation. Well, that's actually not so <laughs> essential a case. Uh, software may change, hardware may change, versions may change, they're all hard. So these are all hard barriers and dealing with all of them, trying to track your object state through all of these barriers and trying to have this pristine version of Hank that still is called Hank, still the same position, maybe change from sphere to cube, but that doesn't matter. Uh, if you want to have Hank all the time, you have to contend with these barriers, but it's really hard. So in the end, I just said, why don't we just focus on this safe game? barrier. We only really have to deal with the one barrier because we don't really need edit and play mode. We can just stay in play mode all the time. And we don't really need to have the objects exist through a recompile. We can just destroy the object, uh, destroy actually the whole game, recompile, and then load the game again. So the only thing we have to do is we have to save our game state and then we have to load our game state. That's the only barrier I tried to fight with uh, in the end. And this uh, results in what I call poor man's hot reloading, because it doesn't actually change the code and continue playing. What is uh, hot reload? Well, hot reloading technically would be just change the code, don't change the object state. But what I actually do is just destroy everything 
and rebuild it. So it doesn't really work in real life that way, but I've made a toggle here that enables poor man's hot reloading. And now we can see that if we change anything about our code, what is interesting, well, maybe just add an enter here, very interesting change, constitutes recompile anyway. We recompile and the game keeps running. And <laughs> we basically recreated recompile and continue, but on our own terms and we did it in a safe manner. We know exactly what is happening and it, it always works um, uh, rather than Unity just screwing up your game state. And we're gonna look at how this helps us developing our game model expanding our game model. So let's make our game a little bit more interesting. Let's add the fact that there are buildings. So the game is going to now support a list of buildings. We'll go a bit more into how that works on the back side because I promised to uh, show you a serialization system. Villagers can now erect buildings at some point in their lives in a very random manner. Let's hope the random is favored, favors us. And yeah, buildings. So let's see if that works. Does it compile even? Nope. So obviously we need the fact that the game has a list of buildings. So I'm iterating, this is real life development, right? I'm making mistakes and now sadly things break, but hey, is Hank still there? Let's see. Yes, Hank is still there, that's great. And Hank can now build buildings. All of these characters can build buildings. In a random time, they will uh, erect a building. Let's see how they do. Oh, somebody created a building. There's one there, it's not in the game. Oh, there's another one. And these buildings, well, they're not really anything but colored blocks right now, but let's add something too. The buildings will spawn villagers. This is what I love about management games. You can easily create a lot of complexity really soon. Mm -mm -mm. Oops. Okay, so our game is still running, it slowed down a little bit, but now our buildings create these little guys there and they have the color of their building. Okay, so we developed our game and we still have our same save state. And of course, you could easily recreate this save state at any point. Here we still have Hank. But you have to imagine if you have a, a game that you were testing and you're 20 hours in, you've got a civilization with a far advanced save game, you really don't want that save game to break as you're adding or tweaking mostly your features. So that's how it works. I can only let this run for a while until it crashes my computer. And let's look at the beautiful glory of complexity for now. Okay, that's it. That's poor man's hot reloading uh, in function. So how do we achieve serialization? So that's the question. I already explained why we cannot use Unity serialization. It's not meant for this type of thing for saving. Because these are actual, actually the save games that I will give my players, or at least that my players will make and save to their memory sticks and their corrupted memory cards at some point. So, of course, I decided to write our own. Um, I, did, I didn't <laughs> not look at other things, but other things usually approach serialization in a quite simple manner. Um, and I think there are several levels of complexity to serialization. So the most simple ways you often see is, hey, I can just write some data to some keys. I can write my score uh, to the value score, and I can write the position of my player to the value or the key position. Um, that's actually level one, like just saving some data of your game. Level two means that every object in the game saves their own data. So I've got my villager here, and I've got another villager there, and they both save their own data. But in my game, you saw villagers can be spawned. So I, I cannot just save two bits of data for two villagers. I actually have to maintain a list of villagers. I have to uh, serialize the fact that villagers are even existing or other objects. So this is already harder to serialize data for a dynamic set of a certain type. And now we can go even further, the identity like what if you have different subclasses? You have a villager, like a worker villager, it derives from the villager uh, class, and you've got like an, a warrior villager, and all of them 
uh, need to be somehow maintained through saving and loading. And then the hardest part is as always, well, not as always, but relations, relationships between these polymorphic objects. If we have a management game, all things reference each other. Like uh, Hank, for example, can have a friend, and that friend, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Great, okay. I'm so glad I found um, like a wall plug for my computer to plug in. Don't worry, guys, Hank is still there, even though I exited the play mode. Oh, okay. Um, so it makes automatic saves under the hood sometimes, which is, uh, allows you for time traveling, but that's another talk. Um, so we have to contend with this interconnected set of polymorphic objects. So how do we do that? So there are a couple of bits, and I only want to really go into the first two of these right now. Uh, one is the Abbey model. It's the basic node. A villager in the game you just saw is an Abbey model. It's a basic node of the tree, a building block of your save game, and every Abbey model describes their own data set. We'll see that in code in a bit. And then there's the way you actually do everything. You uh, traverse your entire Unity scene to figure, and your C-sharp state, to figure out what needs to be saved and in what order. That's the work of the data saver and the data loader for loading. They work very similarly, uh, you'll see that in a bit, and they just crawl over the whole game state tree, basically. And then the, the lower two are just about how do you actually get that stuff to disk. If you have everything, how do you get that to disk? If you want to know more about it, just approach me after the talk. So what is an Abbey model? I already told you it's a building block. It's also a bridge between a variable villager that I have in C Sharp and an object in my Unity. So it says objects and objects. That's C Sharp objects with a lowercase o and Unity engine objects with a higher case o. It also controls the life cycle of an object. So it has things like start, stop, destroy, that sort of stuff. But most importantly for now, it describes the safe state of that object. So the villager looks like this. Uh, we just worked in this code. Um, the villager describes that everything it wants in the save game is this. Their name, their velocity, uh, both angular and normal, uh, the, the place they are, the transform, uh, that means the position in Unity terms, their friend, if they have a friend, and the building they spawned. So they will save all of this. Um, how does that work? So normally, if you save a game, you have to write some data to disk. If you load a game, you have to load some data from disk. Um, so actually, this is just a single thing I write. And that's really important for me, because I quickly want to add new systems and new game models to uh, my game. So I just uh, want to add a few lines here and there, like you saw me doing with the buildings. Uh, and then I have a building in my game. I don't want to write the save logic and then the load logic and maybe the creation logic. I just want to write that in one go. So that's how, um, that's how this method works. It gets, if you see, this thing called an archive, and that's where the real magic happens. It's an interface, and actually this method is called in three different ways. It's called um, for saving with a save archive. It's called for loading with a load archive. And whenever the villager is first created, so when it spawns in the game, then it's called with a creation archive. And all three of these things go to that same line of code that you see here, this, the same piece of code with a different me method. So if we zoom in it, it this thing called speed, the third line, we serialize speed. We say we want speed to be saved in the string uh, speed. We want the speed value. We want to reference the speed value. We'll see why we need that. And we want to give a default value sometimes. So what happens? Um, when we save it, we store that data. When we load it, we retrieve the data and put it in the reference that we got. So we got the value of speed and put it back into the variable speed. And when it's created, we can set a default value like this. Um, so that's a way that you can, oh, I don't know why I did that. That's a, how you can write one line of code and make sure that saving works, that loading works, and creation works. So this was just data. Like it was a low level of complexity. But where it gets interesting and complex is ownership. So now we're talking about these references, right? There are, there's an interconnected set of objects that we have to deal with. So what you see here is the game class. So it's the core, that little thing um, here that is created at the start. 
and it has a, a list of villagers and it has a list of buildings. And again, I use this to uh, save and load and create uh, a list of villagers. And it does all kinds of things. Like it, al it also looks quite complicated, but once you're used to it, uh, it gets easier. But it does a lot of things. So uh, one, it m gives me a list in C Sharp with villagers. Two, it puts all those villagers into the um, apparent relation with this uh, villagers object. Um, three, it saves all these villagers if you are saving. Four, it loads all these villagers if you're loading. And five, it creates uh, all these villagers once you add a new villager to the list. And to do that, it needs to know a couple of things. It needs to know which prefab to use. So does it use the sphere or do, does it use the cube, basically? Um, and uh, it also needs to know about its dependencies. It's a, this is a more technical thing. Let's skip that for now. But this line here, so it's actually one line with some enters in between, it gives me everything I need to save, load, and create villagers. So later on, if I um, want to create a villager in my game, I have this spawn villager method. And all it really does is on that special list, it calls create new, and then there's a villager. It's in my Unity scene, it's in my list, and it's got the right prefab and everything. And then it gives it a random name, apparently. Um, it, so you see that the code here is divided in two different methods. And the above one, it defines ownership relations. We'll get into that a bit more. And the uh, lower one uh, is just simple data, whatever I want the object to remember, like its name, Hank. So why are references hard? And why are they treated so special? And why am I giving them so much praise and hate? Individual objects do not live in a vacuum. And implementing reference loading for an arbitrary set is really hard. You have to deal with object order. You have to deal with the initialization order within every object. You have to provide dependencies at the right time. And soon you will see that if, you, if the player made some gigantic save game and you try and load it, everything everything goes wrong because it does everything in the wrong order. It um, hasn't got a position, even though it needs to provide a position to another class, that sort of thing. So initialization order is hard. And there are different ways to, uh, to go about that. The order in which you save objects and the order in which you load and create objects um, back, uh, back in loading. So how do we traverse? We could do that um, as a, a graph. We could say we really don't care about the order uh, in which we instantiate objects, so that's the top uh, image. We just create all these little Abbey models, and then afterwards we just create some links in between. And then we could do it in a tree way. We first load A, which is the game, then the game loads B, C, and D, and uh, according to that order, it keeps on loading everything in a certain order. So I chose for the tree order, uh, like the first one is more simple to think about. You just have this method that says load all objects, load all references in between all relationships. But the second one is actually much more like you would play the game. Like if you start out with an empty world in Reyes, for example, there's nothing but the planet and maybe three giants on there. And then they create a tree and then the planet creates a village. And all these things are attached to each other. So really you are creating a tree-like safe game state as you go. And this is a very natural way to also load back up your game. You start with a planet, you put your giants on there, and, and so you go on. But it cannot be exactly the same uh, because you have to do it in an instant rather than over the course of 20 hours of gameplay. So we picked the tree, there's lots of technical reasons, but really why it's more natural, it more so uh, mirrors the creation process. Um, yeah, I just said about it. So how do we do that? Uh, so do we do a two-pass serialization, and it uses those two methods that you saw for the uh, game. It first uh, traverses this tree, so it tr tr tries to explore this whole tree. It says, hey game, is there anything that you own? And the game says, yes, I own a list of villagers. I want all the villagers to be instantiated, and I own um, the buildings. I want all the buildings to be instantiated. And it gives all the data that it needs. And then, after everything is done, serialize ontology, this top method. It's basically the structure is serialized. And this is just one method, but you 
like in the game that we're creating, there's hundreds of methods that all, or hundreds of objects that all have their serialized ontology, and everything is owning different things, and there's this huge, gigantic tree that's your safe state. After everything has serialized the structure, you now know what the structure of your safe game looks like, then you can start loading back in the data. Everything gets called serialized data. Note that I'm talking about the load pass, but this happens the same in the save pass. We first save the structure, and then we save the data, although it matters less in that case. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, the last piece of technical, uh, technical uh, part. Um, I think I'm going on quite a while already, so the main takeaways that I want to give you are, one, management games are really beautiful things. They're complex, even if they're just making safe games. That is very valuable in itself. Um, Really, this talk is just a celebration of safe, uh, safe state, I hope. Uh, you can actually use that safe state. So rather than seeing serialization as an, uh, as an afterthought, you just have to do it right at the start of development and keep doing it because it can help you do poor man's hot reloading, which is the best you're going to get in a big Unity project, I believe. Otherwise, come talk to me. Use descriptive per object serialization, like we saw with the villager, so that every object that you create, you just add the serialized method and then, bam, you have persistence. And four, ownership and serialization order is hard. I tried my best explaining some of the concepts there, but really I would need another hour or so to um, do everything justice. There's a lot more to talk about, but for now I want to ask if you guys have questions. And thanks for your <laughs> attention. Thank I you. I know there was lots of codes and not so many images, so I really appreciate uh, not seeing that many yawns, that's great. Let's look uh, where Hank is. Where's Hank? Any questions? Let's give Hank a friend as well. No questions. How's Hank doing? There's a question. Good catch. Um. Hello. Um, so great talk, thank you. Um, so I was wondering, uh, right now your, um, the saving is very uh, code, code heavy. Um, like it's quite explicit. You write uh, have to write a lot of code to make saves happen. W have you also looked into like an attribute-based approach for the different fields in the Abbey model thing? Because that's normally a ho yeah. how I do it, and it works really well. Um, so yeah, I, I'm yeah. sure you've thought about that. Yeah. So uh, so Unity of course does it that way too. So you have this serialized field and uh, don't serialize this, and it's a way to. Uh, um, ascribe more like attributes to your data. And it's a nice way because right now, uh, if we have the, the game, for example, the villager and the building list is already here. And then again, I have to write that I want to save it here. Um, I think I could probably port this to doing attributes. When I started out uh, creating a system, I didn't ha know about attributes. But the whole cons concept here is to, to describe how you want to serialize data. So it would make sense to use attributes because they're actually descriptive, while this is still like a method that is being executed in different ways. Yeah, good idea. Nice. Any more questions? There we go. Th this fellow tried. Oh. Nope. Close enough. Thank you. Now you have Thank to. you. It's, it's kind of a follow-up to the previous question, but um, I saw you skipped over a little part of the slide where you said avoid reflection. Yeah. Because that's how those attribute-based things tend to work, right? Like how Unity does it, and the most of the saving plugins that I've come across use attributes, but then it uses yeah. uh, reflections. So I was wondering why that was something that you were attempting yeah, to so, avoid. Yeah, um, so, yeah, good question. So one thing I didn't talk about, but um, so, so what is reflection? Reflection is while you're executing C-sharp code, you actually reason about that same C-sharp code. So you can talk about types and you can talk about method parameters and that sort of thing. It's really meta. And um, the reason I don't want to use it is because it's slow. Like you can at the start do a lot of caching and then you can use it quite fastly. But what I uh, try to do so you, you notice that I use saving and loading a lot, so I want it to be really fast. And uh, I don't want to investigate the C-sharp state while I'm saving it. So instead, and that's 
probably also another answer to your question. Um, sorry, I'm just going through everything here. The nice thing here, when I go into these methods and go all the way down to when it's saved in, when it's tokenized to serializable C sharp objects and when it's put into the binary formatter, it just keeps remembering that my name in this case is a string. All these methods look the same, but underwater, this is a string method, string, an overloaded string method. Uh, sorry, it works on string value, on an int value, and it goes all the way down to more complicated types. So it remembers the type, it's a statically typed serialization method, and that makes it way faster because you don't have to uh, switch and inspect your assembly while you're saving. For polymorphic lists, so lists that can, uh, are of the type list villager, but can have warriors in there and builders in there and anything. Uh, I do have to do it because I cannot see it in the static type, whether it's a villager or not. I have to inspect the runtime state. I have to use get type or type off, that sort of thing. It's a bit slower, but this way, like even in a game that we've been developing for like almost two years now, like saving and loading is just an instant. And that's really nice because I don't want that to be slow if I'm using it every time I make a code change. Um, yeah, that's my most, uh, like, I haven't tested it because I only had time to implement one of the solutions. But, like, sure. part, part of the reason I wanted to do this talk is because during the whole pandemic isolation, it was really hard to pick other people's brains. I tried to pick Rutger's brain a lot, for example. Um, I should have probably picked Aaron's brain a lot more, and many of you that I don't know are, are making cool code and games. Um, but I wanted to just put this solution out there because I wanted this information when I started making management games in Unity. And now hopefully it's here and now people can say to me, well, I'm doing it this way. It's probably better. Um, yeah, nice. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Can also be totally unrelated. And oh, this is a far one. <laughs> And also, I do encourage you, like, it's a lunch break after this, to just come up to me and... You had a question, right? Yeah. yeah. Ask more questions, look at my code, nothing is secret. Yes, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Really interesting uh, concepts and stuff that I'm definitely going to use myself. <laughs> cool. But I was wondering uh, uh, your opinion on uh, stuff like uh, the, the hot reloading. Uh, if you're working with really large, complex libraries uh, on the background as well, because one of the things I have with VR development is that uh, when you try hot reloading in Unity, the in all these libraries just crash in the background. Right, yeah. We have uh, I was wondering if you had some insights in the, into that and how to prevent that, uh, that sort of stuff with your poor man's hot reloading method. Yeah. So the nice thing about poor man's hot reloading is that I try to skip the whole thing. But the problem that you're describing, we experience it too. We use uh, Spine, which is like a 2D skeletal animation library, and it doesn't handle Unity's recompile and continue properly. So it crashes. Most often it crashes. And we can, of course, try and get them to fix that, but it's not on their priority because recompile and continue, I think, is just a dream in advanced projects. Um, so what? So I don't really care if uh, the libraries crash because I just re <laughs> restart everything. And if it's, if it's really fundamental, I just exit and enter play mode. It's fast enough. And I just load my game back up. And I can write some methods that uh, help me clean up the proper game state, reinstantiate spine if I want, and then, uh, or whatever it needs to, to function, and then load my save game. The most important is that I have my coveted save game, and it's here, and Hank is safely in my pocket. I understand <laughs> where he is. Yeah. So that's like, it's not a specific answer to how you fix those library crashes, but the whole idea is that it's so much work to make sure that the entire Unity ecosystem yes. survives your recompile and continue. So just don't do it. All it's right, a, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good answer as well. So, so I can... Uh, it's just uh, three barriers of doom yep. that I was talking about. Absolutely. Like Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the question. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Manuel.